Uh, my name is Pavel Roleder. I'm CTO at Techland, and CTO means I'm not doing the code anymore, which I miss a lot. I'm just fostering the creative space for other developers to make code. Um, and I hope they're, they're doing a better job than I did in the past. Um, besides that, the CTO job is to create a strategy uh, for technology. And current strategy for Techland is to make more than one AAA title at the same time. For like 20, 25 years, we were making only one title at a time. And technology was tailored for this one title. This time, we take the decision, OK, let's, let's make it shareable tech and make more than, more than one at the same time. Uh, before we can start, um, this is a takeaway for the talk. So I wanted to tell you about two, two things um, that we specifically learned for over the last two years. So how to set up the programming environment to really support this kind of a setup. So how to develop the tech and how to use the tech simultaneously when, to when working on two AAA pipelines at the same time. Plus, what are the uh, best practices that we learned from, from that process? So some practices how to manage the programming teams um, in, in terms of 80 programmers working in the same environment. So the agenda is as follows. Uh, thanks. Uh, first, I'll tell you a little bit about our setup and when we start when working on Dying Light 1 and then how we moved in Dying Light 2 and the other AAA title that I'm not allowed to, to talk about more. But still, from the tech perspective, I'll give you a little bit of insights of that. And then uh, we'll see what is the bumpy road of trunk-based development and how we make that road from trunk-based development through feature streams to trunk-based development again, but in a different form. Um, then I'll present you to our current solution. And the solution is here, but I made the image small enough that you couldn't see it right now, that you need to stay for the rest of the presentation. Um, in the second part of the presentation, I'll, I'll show you the lessons learned that we um, extracted from, from this experience. And at the end of the talk, um, the talk is supposed to be 35 to 40 minutes. We'll have the Q&A session. So if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, please write them down and ask at the end. Um, before we start, I'll give you a little bit of um, background, how, what are our setups. So when switching from one project to multiple projects, because switching from one to two is probably harder than from, from two to five because it's changing like the different approach and mentality and, and, and whatever. There are three major challenges if you find in this situation like that in your company, whether it's small or, or big. The first challenge is the architecture and the engine architecture. We've been doing one game and one tech for 25 years. So as you, can, as you could imagine, the architecture isn't ready for creating more than one title at the same time sharing the same tech. So the, the engine itself, the architecture, how it's being developed, how it's being pushed into production environment is a challenge. The second thing is the technical production or technical direction. So how the programmers should work in this setup. And this presentation will cover, cover like majority of, of this part. Um, and the third important part is the mentality. So right now, there is like no possibility for a programmer to think about one game only. You need to think whether you're working on the tech side, like on the engine side, maybe system, system side, and think whether it's going to hit to two games or maybe only one game as a gameplay programmer. So it's, it's kind of a different in, in terms of mentality, how to work, how to think about features, how to think about the architecture of the features. And we'll, we'll be talking about that a little bit more in, in, in this talk. But the, ma the majority of, of, of the talk will cover how the technical production is set up to really be able to, to do what, what we meant to do. <coughs> and getting back to 2015 and even earlier, Dying Light 1 was made in trunk-based development, which means everyone was like creating the, the work on the single branch or single stream. Or that was branch by then. We were using Perforce. And in 2015, there were no streams. So the single branch was used for all the development process. I mean, not only programming stuff, but also the content creators were using the same branch. In more details, we had something around 40 programmers, both gameplay programmers, system programmers, and engine programmers working on one environment, plus something about 80 content creators 
also using the same environment. Um, we had approximately 250 submits per day, so like every two minutes or every three minutes, um, and some kind of a, we call it continuous integration, but this is like the automatic building procedure of testing the binaries that was checked in into the Perforce for every, every 15 minutes. Yeah, and we had some issues with the stability, as you can imagine, because we have 40 programmers on the stream, so the ideal number of programmers working on one stream is zero, because then they cannot break anything. You won't have any f new features as well, but still, you can maintain the stability pretty, pretty easily. Um, and we had 40, right? So it was like um, very unstable. We didn't have any automated tests, so um, we experienced the phenomena, which is incredible debug. So anytime the programmer committed the bad code, someone was showing up like 30 seconds after or one minute that, okay, the editor is black. 80 people cannot work. Can we go home? Yeah, that was the situations. So as you can imagine, it, it wasn't a good like, environment for, for work. But still, of course, programmers were pushing to deliver new features, right? So they needed to submit the code. Um, we had also nightly built a uh, procedure that, uh, that was taking up, uh, to up to four hours. And that was the full build, which has been tested by the QA every day, um, like exploiting and, and finding, finding some exploits and, and, and bugs. But this is like only for the whole build. Then during the day, we were just fighting with the submits um, like every two minutes. So after Dying Light 1 was released, we decided to, OK, let's separate technology development uh, from the game development, from the production stream, not to break this production pipeline every day. So the idea was, like, in theory, something like that. Sorry for the CDU graphics. It, it won't be a, a lot of this. this. But I just make um, the visible part more, more important. We decided, in theory, to make the production stream, which should be stable. So going up, you have the more stable environment. And the development streams, going down, you have a feature set. So if you are going down, you have like a lot of engine stuff and new research and evaluating new technologies, uh, new renderer stuff, new lighting system, and, and, and so on. And the idea is that we have several teams working like below, submitting the code into common trunk for pre-production for UAT is user acceptance testing. So we wanted to test everything before it's going to the production stream. And then the content creators have very stable version because it's tested, it's verified. If there's like no new version or the new version does not work, we just don't push it up to the production stream. So that was the theory. And we ended up with a model something like this. This is the stream um, set up on the Perforce. So we have a tech main below here. This is our trunk for technology. We have a game logic here, which is like for gameplay programming uh, teams. And we have main production streams um, on the top that are meant to be stable and that are meant to, do, to release on, or to get really stable version of the technology like the editor executables and all the tool set. Um, this image contains already two games there, but we didn't know about the, the, the second game there, so we just wanted to, to make it theoretically, but everything was prepared for one game. And suddenly, um, after we figured the model for how to do it, uh, yeah, there was a strategic decision of let's do two AAA games, of course stable, of course, um, delivering technology on a, on a daily basis because new features, there are new, like, new features needed for Dying Light 2. So it was, it was really a challenge, right? That this is like, we are fighting that for two years and still, um, still trying to accomplish everything. That, that should work perfectly. So to summarize the premise, the, 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 the goal that we set was, okay, we need to work on two AAA games simultaneously, sharing the same code base because this is one that we wanted to, to, to achieve. So the game should be a little bit similar, but not too much. But still, the engine part and the system part should be the same. Um, of course, at the same time, when the games are being in production or pre-production, we want to develop the technology, like pushing streaming, new animation system, new AI system, um, content generator um, for bigger worlds, 
um, new quest system because of choices and consequences in Dyglade 2. So a lot of systems that need to be delivered to the engine team, to the lower uh, layer of, of, of the tech once two games are being in development. Of course, we want to maintain stability. So we don't want the situation from Dying Light 1 when like, the editor was broken like six times a day. So we don't want to break production pipeline. There's like too costly for the company. When 80 people or 100 people can't work for one day, it's really, it's really costly for the company, right? So this is something we wanted to eliminate at the first place. Of course, to do that, to, to, to test the technology, we needed to invest in automated testing. Um, and I'll show you a little bit more on that. And of course, we wanted to make developers happy. So um, if you make the, the environment too complex, they will be complaining that, OK, I, need, I did my work as a programmer. Now I need to merge something, my stuff. Why? I, I'm just a programmer, not an not integrator, not, not the DevOps, right? So this is, this is really important to make them happy because they are making features, right? So, and of course, at the end of the day, all features need to be delivered in the common build because we're making one game or two games and not like the bunch of separate features. So we came up with the idea, we, we read a lot of, about different solutions and we came up with the idea of feature streams. So you can divide your team into different streams and they can work on their features without interrupting, interrupting each other. So it is, it's some kind of a stable environment for the AI, uh, for the dialogue system, for the quest system, for the engine team separately. And this was, this was our idea, so we still have the engine in the bottom with the different streams. We have core stream, we have tool stream, rendering stream. But for the game logic, so for the gameplay code, we decided to implement different streams for AI, for dialogue, for quest, and other systems in the game. But it didn't work properly because at the end of the sprint, for example, we came up with like five different builds or six different builds because each team wanted to show their work and the integration between those was very painful. So it was something like this. We're trying to put everything into the common stream, but of course it wasn't very easy to achieve that. Not mentioning the hell with like fixing bugs and okay, I fixed the bug, but on which stream? Yeah, I'm waiting for it, but I cannot merge because I'm waiting for no another stream to, give, to be merged in the, on the first place, right? So it was really, really a disaster, and it, it surely didn't make the developers happy. Maybe we, like, we, we weren't like, breaking the, the pipeline, but the features were delivered very late because of the streaming and, uh, sorry, because of the integration process, which was very, very, very difficult. So we decided that in the future, we want to go from, from the left side, from the feature, uh, feature streams, into something like, which is called the one trunk. And the year ago, we went in that state, and we wanted to go into this state. And this is something that I'm going to tell, tell you a little bit more today, because, because it started to work for us. So we got rid of the feature streams. Everything is on the trunk. You can still use feature streams, but not for it's like not very often practice to do that. Uh, so we encourage everyone to work on the tech main. And the final solution looks like this. So it's very similar to the, uh, to the right side from the previous slide. And I'll tell you a little, bit, a little bit about it right now, how it, how it works. So we encourage every programmers for two games and for two technologies to work here. That's about the 80 programmers right now. Right? So we are allow them to check in their codes on a daily basis once they're finished their work right away to, the, to, this, to this trunk. That means the submits like every one minute or every 40 seconds to, to the trunk. To maintain stability, because as we remembered from Dying Light 1, it was not a very stable solution, but to maintain stability, we have uh, a bunch of servers that checks the code every two, every three minutes. We were able to in, um, introduce fast build to do that, and we, can, we are able to make the whole code rebuild in two minutes. So every two minutes, we have the new executables that we can also test automatically, and this is very important. We implemented test complete, which is the tool that allows us to do the 
automated testing for the editor. So there is no more situations that the editor has not been tested once it's being delivered to the user and users. And this is very, very important, right? right? So there are, there are no, like no more situations when the editor is black or something is, something is crashing at the startup. We were able to really figure it out on the tech main level. Going further, uh, we have uh, feature streams, but these are like more like a task, task streams. And task streams are very small streams just for the um, engine development. And if someone is working on DirectX 12 implementation, for example, uh, it's like there is no necessity to work on that on the tech main. It takes some time, like two or three months to make an implementation. It's not vital to the production streams. They are not waiting for this. So it's really good to have the task stream, but also we are trying to synchronize with the tech main very often, right? So we're not, we're trying to avoid merging hell, and that's, that's, that's the reason. We have a DevOps team, which is not so big. We have a team about of five people that is responsible for delivering technology to the production streams and data from the production streams to the technology. Because we want the tech team, and not, not, this is not only tech team, right? All the gameplay programmers are also sitting on tech main. We want them to have the latest data because they want to, we want them to deliver features based on the current data, right? So the, um, one of the assumptions, one, uh, one of the premises is that we want to deliver technology to the games on a daily basis and getting back the data on a daily basis as well or on a weekly basis. It depends on, on the project needs or on the um, engineering needs, whether they need the new map or the new assets, it's up to them. And the DevOps team is responsible to do that. And uh, in more details, they are working like that, that there is a local machine. And for example, we are syncing to the game one environment, integrating everything from the tech main. Once we know that after continuous integration tests, it's green, so we can like, integrate it to the production stream and then push back to the game uh, production the latest code. Then we have an like, updated production environment. And vice versa, on the other hand, we're syncing up to the tech main, we're integrating data from the production stream, and we can just push the data to the, uh, to the content folder for the engine creators, for the, for the code creators um, on the tech main stream. And Finally, on the production streams, we have like all the content creators, which have the stable uh, tool set, new features every day, um, like almost every day, because we have something like 80% of efficiency when delivering technology to, um, to production streams every day. So that means that every week we can deliver four, at least four times uh, new technology and new code to production streams, which is quite okay for us, right? which is stable, of course, and that's, that's very important. And now, trying to get everything together, what worked for us in that setup? How, why it took us like two years to get there? So first of all, um, don't use team streams, because at the beginning, our feature streams were, were not like feature dedicated, but they were like team ed dedicated. So we had, for example, stream, separate stream for tools team, and it's not good. Right, because they are working on different features, and every sprint they were like uploading all the work from the team, um, from the tools team. And if there is a request for the tools team to fix something, they were fixing on their stream, uh, but they couldn't like upload it because the other features on that stream, on that tools team, were in progress. So we needed to wait uh, uh, until the end of, of the sprint, which is not efficient at all. Yeah, so the, the bad lesson from feature streams or from, from the team streams was that we had on the, at the end of the streams uh, sprint, we had different builds with different features. AI team was presenting um, their achievements in different builds on the quest system team, on the dialogue system team, and we had the feeling that we are not making the same game, but like many different games. And of course, those teams were like depending on each other. For example, someone could set up a test, um, test quest, because yeah, they had the new dialogue system, but they didn't have the quest system, like the latest version, so it was really pain. Um, yeah, and fixing bugs was, re uh, was really hell because we didn't know where the fix is. When you like, ask the, the, the engine or system programmer, 
hey, there is a bug. Have you fixed it? Yeah, I fixed that on three streams already. And the issue was on the fourth stream, right? So it's, well, it really got lost when, um, on the current state of, of, of bugs. And it was really also um, very hard to manage that in the Mantis. We're using Mantis for, for bug fixing. Yeah, so nobody knew what, what is the current status, um, especially from, from, from the bugs perspective, right? There was that these um, uh, dependency issues, so one team was waiting for another to submit into the common uh, game logic stream, but like it was no no one wanted to do it because it was like merging in into integration, which was painful. So it just didn't work. Uh, what we used and we are using right now, and it worked, is use task streams under the trunk. So not <coughs> higher in the hierarchy, but working on the, some engine features like rendering stuff, it's OK. Yeah, our continuous integration, it's not like the full continuous integration that you know from the IT industry. So it's not like integration when like everything is OK from the um, automated test. But this is like checking the current version of the trunk like every two minutes, seeing if everything is OK. This is like the, the photo from, from our room we installed monitors showing what's the status of trunk. If there is like red, this is like red alert, everyone needs to fix trunk because we have 80 people working there. You cannot break people's work, right? So this is, this is the red situation, we need to fix that. Later, um, like a couple of days ago, we've introduced even something which is automatically locking the tech main. So if the status is red, you cannot submit anything unless you, you are the one who causes the, um, the, the, the red alert, right? So you needed to fix that. And we're testing this some kind of a very hard rules not to submit to your features unless it's really fixed for, for the problem that is being right now. So we're doing code changing, uh, code changes uh, every two minutes. We are doing uh, editor change, uh, testing every 20 minutes. So test complete is being used there to verify those changes. So once we have the binaries every two minutes, we can just run the tests. And test to, takes 20 minutes to really see the, um, the state of the editor. We also do the asset compilation to verify whether the, the changes in the code changed something. Like there's like asset compiler has changed, so every asset needs to be rebuilt. Uh, yeah, we're doing the, the nightly builds as well. They're taking right now like something like three hours, three hours and a half, which is important. And we achieve that. We're pushing the code, like hold the code, the engine code and the gameplay code to the production streams every day. This is very important. With the success ratio I mentioned, so there are like weeks that we're able to deliver every day. We've also introduced something which is get latest stable build. Um, so you can sync to the latest green labeled um, submitted change list on the Perforce, right? So if you break the build and the um, continuous integration say, OK, it's become red from green, and there's like red, 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 you can sync, sync to the latest green if you really need the stable version for your working environment. So this is the feature that we've introduced like two or three weeks ago. The lessons learned also is that um, the, the ideal situation is not no merging at all, right? So once everyone is working on one environment, we can just submit to the trunk, and there is no stream merging, unless it's a task stream below, below the tech main. But still, we are trying to think very often not to get any integration um, errors or just solving conflicts, right? So this is really painful as well. And uh, in, in, in feature streams approach, we are constantly colliding with different work, touching the same parts of code. It was really a disaster. And yeah, the, the programmers were, were always can introduce some errors in their code. But the majority of issues that we, that we experienced in the, in the previous um, solution was not like the programming fault, but programmer's fault, but uh, integrations, right? So they're like solving uh, code conflicts was just really, really bad. 
in ideal case, as I said, uh, don't merge at all. Submit directly to Trunk and then solve potential issues right away that everyone can see what is the current status. And we have only one environment to maintain in terms of uh, bugs, uh, list of bugs, stability. We can put all the builders' power, let's say, to really try to test it from, from, from different perspective. And as I said, we introduced uh, the auto automation for locking the trunk when it's broken. So you cannot, um, you cannot submit more features to really hide this error. Also, as a programmer, you can claim that you're fixing the build. So on the monitor that you, that you see here, you can claim that, OK, the, build is, the trunk is red. I, Pavel, claim this build, and I will be working on that. So everyone knows in the company that I'm the one who, who tries to find the solution for that. OK, we've also comparing to Dynamite Light 1, we've introduced something which is called the DevQA team. We, we like, didn't have in the past the dedicated team of testers that are focusing on testing the programmer's work. They are not just game QA, they are not, not like the functional QA or compliance QA. They are just testers working very closely with programmers to test those, those changes, especially when integrating from the substreams. So their job is to test majority of changes, like all of the bigger changes, and majority of small changes, which are very vital. Like majority of hot, hot fixes are, can be just put it into the trunk right away. But still, if you're a programmer and you're not sure whether this change is like critical or not, you can ask the FQA team to test it. And then they can make a separate build on a separate stream and give you the information it's OK or there are some issues with that that you really need to refine. They are also writing automated testing procedures and up, keeping up to date, especially for the editor, that is changing constantly because like 80 programmers are working on, on, on that, right? And besides automated testing, they're developing tons of useful tools like the telemetry system. So we know that, for example, we have uh, on average, 20 crashes per day on the production environment. We're still constantly fix fixing those, but then the new appears. And using the telemetry, we know that this is something which is OK, because 50, it's not OK. Yeah. But 20 crashes per day per team, which is like 80 people uh, on the production, that means that every four people get one crash per day, which is acceptable by, in, in, in our case. OK. Code reviews. Do you guys do code reviews? Who does code review in the company? OK, nice. So 30%. So we didn't um, use that in the past, and we've introduced that lately. And we experienced that there is like different goals for the code reviews in our case. So the first thing is that it increases the communication between programmers. So each programmer is working on the same environment, finally knows that there is some change in the code in the different areas of the code. Imagine that when using the feature streams, when each of the programming group was working like in a different, on the different streams, they're, they're just say that I don't care what's, what's going on on the different streams. In my environment, everything is OK. But when we started to merge those stuff, it was like hell. So it's the first and the, the best way to communicate other programmers that, hey, I did this kind of a change. Maybe you should take a look into that because it's your code. You're the owner of the, this part of the code. Um, we made it mandatory like a month ago. So you cannot submit the change to the trunk without specifying the reviewer. Uh, you can, in, in, like, in some situations that you're like, doing the hotfix, for example, you need to put the tag no review. So Without those tags, you cannot submit. So there is a perforce trigger that does not allow you to submit the code without one of these tags in the change the description, right? Of course, if you are putting no review, you can do that always. But if, if it crashes, you're screwed. So everyone knows that you like, took the responsibility of not specifying the reviewer, and you broke the code. So this is like some kind of a mental pressure on the programmers to really check their code and really if there is like not review hotfix i really need to focus on that and try not to break the build for 80 other programmers working on the same branch 
the majority of, um, of code review uh, advantages is from post-submit reviews. So we are not blocking programmers before, unless it's like a bigger, bigger issue, bigger change. But um, it works as a, as a communication, right? So after my change is being submitted, I've noticed it, people, that, hey, I've changed your code. It's already there. You can take a look into that. We can discuss, but it's already there. I'm not blocked. I'm not stopped before, uh, before just sh submitting the code into the trunk. And also, seniors and juniors can learn from each other. So seniors can verify junior code when doing code review, and this is like being done either before or after the submit. But also juniors can learn from seniors code when they are doing the review for the seniors code. Yeah, because they, can, they need to learn even different areas of the code, but they need to take a look and say, OK, that's the solution. I could use that in my code as well. So it works like that. And once again, majority of this advantage is that programmers are informed about the change, so there is no situation that OK, someone changed my code. I didn't know about that. I need to know about that because I'll be the reviewer and so on. someone will change my code. Uh, but the question is also about the task streams. So we are talking about the tech main. But as I, I was talking that before, uh, below tech main, there are like DirectX 12, for example, stream, task stream. So when to do the code review? And we decided not to do the code review when we're like integrating this task stream to the tech main because it's like it might change like 70% of the code, like if it's like refactoring or whatever. So we are doing code reviews on the task, self, uh, task stream itself, right? So there's like small code reviews. And then during the integration process, we just ask DevQA to test everything, do the full uh, test, like the full build, bake the full build, play the build. And if it's OK, we can just integrate without any issues. And the sixth learning is that changes take time. So we were here, like, we planned to do this, like, last year. So this is the slide from the presentation from Reboot from last year, because that's, that was the future that I was thinking of. And right now, we are here. So this is very similar. As you can spot, um, there is one difference. I was thinking that the, the one game, which is closer to, to the release, should have their own dedicated team of gameplay programmers on their stream to really uh, focus on the production. But we were able to, to make it even better. And right now, every programmer is sitting on, on the tech main stream, which is very, very good, especially when we're talking about exchanging gameplay programmers' experience and features that they're working on. And also, it helps. In the, in the terms of unifying the engine architecture, because everyone is sitting in, in, in one place. There is like no possibility to develop one game like more in, in towards in some direction, but everyone needs to synchronize in, uh, in a single environment. So this, this is really something that works for us right now. And the conclusions, just to summarize the talk, tech uh, team streams just didn't work for us. So I really not recommending using that. Uh, Trunk-based development reduced for us the pain painful code merging and really allowed the programmers to focus on the feature development, not on the integration part. But still, programmers, and this is bolded here, they are responsible for technical quality of their work. So it's not only about developing features, but also developing stable features in the common environment. And this is very important. This is part of, of, of their job. They know their, their, co their code. They're like the, the best uh, guys to really make it work in the common environment. And this is their responsibility. Substreams, I mean, the, the, the task streams below the trunk based should be synced with trunk based as often as possible to avoid merging uh, differences in the future. So, in the ideal situation, when you're a programmer and working on new renderer, you could just get the data and the fresh code like every day, maybe every week. It depends on you. But you know that at some point, you will need to put your changes into the, tr into the trunk. So you should be really paying attention to what's going on on the trunk, just not to uh, fall into some code conflicts later on. Um, continuous integration, in our, wor in our words, and red alert visibility is vital. So once we install the monitors, we could really like put attention like, hey, 
This is like the red uh, screen here. Please pay attention because there is your name on it who broke the build. So you should really leave whatever you are doing right now and really focus on, on fixing, the, uh, fixing this because there is 79 other programmers that will come to you and say, please fix this because I can't work, right? Mm, uh, Dev QA role also helped us a lot in increasing the quality of the delivered work. So this is also something important. Uh, as I said, the, about the responsibility is a very important part here. And also, we've managed to, to do the automated tests, and that helped a lot. This is under, like an example. Um, world editor by the QA team was tested within an hour. We did very similar tests in test complete, and we can do that in 11 minutes, so it's a lot of way faster. We can also do it on multiple streams. So if you are doing on a task stream, you can just test the editor. You can test the editor on trunk. You can test the editor on the production stream as, as well using the same script procedure. So it's very, very OK. We've also implemented some kind of a monkey bot. Monkey bot, monkey bot is, a, is a very simple player that plays the game and grabs the uh, performance uh, counters, memory usage, test stability into different parts of the game. So we can also generate uh, these reports some kind of automatically every day. So after every nightly builds, there is a monkey bot report saying what's the performance, what are some key points of the game that has been tested. OK. And at the end of the talk, short recap. So we'll see whether you were listening or not. So all programmers on the same stream reduce painful code Merging, good. Code reviews helped us to increase mm, flow between programmers. Communication, good. Programmers are responsible. That's the most important part of the presentation. If you, if you needed to remember just only one thing, let it be this, responsible. The ideal number of programmers on a single branch is zero. Good. One of the games that Techland is working on right now is Dying Light 2. And my first name is Pavel. Good. Thank you very much for the talk. If you have any questions, I'm here. I'll be also till Sunday. Um, yeah, but this is the good time for, for your questions. Yeah, let's yeah. do a Q&A. Okay. Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, what happens if the DevOps team covers an issue when they do the merging to the gameplay teams? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Yeah, they're having a lot of work and getting the programmers involved in, in the issues to their local machines to really solve that. So um, we experienced the situation that, for example, we cannot merge this day. That's why I said that we have like four days per in, in week that with a success. Uh, but they're like, they're constantly resolving issues, right? So if there's like a conflict, but right now we have like very little uh, number of conflicts because on the trunk, we are changing the code, and on the production environment, we're changing the data. In previous, let's say, setup, where we were changing the code, in theory, it was the gameplay code changing there and engine code changing here, but it was just a theory. In practice, we're changing all of the code here, and the merging was very, very painful. There was some situation that we couldn't merge for two weeks because of, the, because of the changes, yeah? Right now, it's not an issue, so if there are like issues, we like coming up with two or three issues per week. They are just solving the issues on the local machine with the appropriate um, developers. So they know, the team of five know all the 80 programmers and, and just calling them on a, on a duty to, to, to fix this on a local machine and find out what's, what's, what's going on, right? But this is like the rare situation, like one per day, one per two days. Okay, thanks for the talk. You're welcome. 
So, uh, does it happen that you must uh, integrate with uh, some other repo? Like, uh, we have uh, matchmaking services, they could uh, change their uh, API, and uh, we can't work with DevelopStream. Uh, how do you handle problems like this? Hmm. Yeah, so we are using um, middlewares, not so many of them. Um, to be honest, we are using middleware for audio and for video playback, and the rest of us is, is like ours. Of course, not mentioning um, Zleep and other like common open source stuff, but uh, everything is being done on trunk. So if there is like the new um, middleware, we are trying to integrate it directly on on uh, Tech Main, which is our trunk. If this is like a bigger change and it requires some refactor, we are creating the task stream below the trunk based. And that's the start of the standard procedure. Of course, it's, if it's a big change and we don't want to integrate, like going for the hell of integration, we are doing that directly on the tech main. And there is a possibility to lock the main for some time. Right? For example, we are, I don't know, changing tabs into spaces. And we need to, need to touch 70% of the files or 80% of the files. We can just lock it, like for the afternoon, do the change on the tech main, submit it, and then it's like there. So this is the best way not to, um, yeah, to avoid merging for the, for, for that, that, that's the first reason. But the second reason is to really do the fast situations like that, that require like huge amount of code to be, to be touched. Okay. Is this answer your question? Yeah. Okay, good. More questions? All right, so just two quick questions. Uh, so first of all, um, you mentioned at one point that all of your programmers are on tech main. So if I understood you correctly, there are absolutely no programmers on the game uh, yep. streams. So what about features that are different between the two games? Like what, what happens if game one needs a dialogue system, game two doesn't? And secondly, for the code reviews, um, you mentioned that you can't submit without the reviewer tag. But what do I do then if I write some code? Do I walk up to you, tell you, hey, come here and check out this code, and you manually come to my PC, review it? And, or is there some sort of automated system that I submit my code to you, something like that? Yeah, so starting with the code review, um, yeah, the code review is like just a name. You can do the code review in a different ways. You can use the review board to really review the code. You can just talk to another guy and like, talking, okay, I made, a change that, I, I, I made a change like this, you said it's okay, we're just submitting it, but I put you as a reviewer, right, in the, in the tag still. So it doesn't have to be the review that we all sit together with, in a team of five and looking at the, every line of the code. It's, yeah, it's, sometimes it's happening because some changes in the kernel are very, like, uh, sensitive and there are, like, need to be, like, uh, more directors involved in that. But uh, we can agree that I will just tell you about the change and that's it. Yeah? If we decide that it's not crucial, we can just submit it. Um, so there are, there are different levels of code review, but in general we call, we call it code review. But still you need to put a tag uh, when in the change list uh, description. Um, getting back to your first question, um, yes, we are working like all on the tech main, but we have different folders for the game one, game two, and the engine. So all the programmers have access to, to all the code there, and you can just develop only one game in terms of the gameplay, not affecting the engine. But this is your call, whether you're working on something which is common for two games or for one game specifically. This is like maybe topic for another discussion or another talk. Uh, we, had the solu we have the solution also that we are working on right now to that one game can inherit from another. So it's like still one game is treated as a game framework, and on the top of that is the second game, and automatically you are getting everything from the first game, but you can make, make those games a little bit different. So this is the way that you don't have to integrate the gameplay code between two folders, right? Because you want to, ideal, in an ideal situation, you would like to have the feature list here, and from like architectural perspective, it's even better to put it here like you have 20 features uh, here, but this game uses only 12, and this uses 15, for example, right? So we still try to make the, the engine big, the tech big, 
and the small game, which are just the bubbles and just the data-driven setup, how the features are being used and configured. So this is like the strategy in, in, in overall. Thank you. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> how do you think your uh, methodology of your work, how do you think it would scale on different team sizes? For example, a team double your size or a team half your size? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the idea is also to think about the future. So as I said, we're scaling from one to two, but in theory, it's from one to n, when n is like two or more, right? So we really believe that this setup uh, is scalable. Um, we also work in, in a group of like 20 and 40 programmers there. Right now it's 80, and we really believe this is something which is, which is scalable. Of course, if you have more programmers, you will probably have more change list in one minute, submit it into the, um, into the trunk, but still uh, maybe buying more builders just to, you know, to do more check-ins of the, of the current state is, is, is okay. So I think for now, we don't uh, also have plans to scale like in thousands of, of, of programmers or uh, dev teams, so it works for, for now, and I think we are ready for third or, or even fourth project right now, yeah? and this is like the setup for us. We don't want to be like too general, uh, we have also the, the technology which is tailored for some kind of games, and we want those games to be the best in terms of this technology, like this, not this, right? Yeah, but I think for the upcoming like five years or more, it's, it will be enough and it will scale. So, are, you, are your features complete in uh, one day? So, uh, if a developer starts working on a task, like adding a new weapon or mechanic, can he complete it, uh, can they complete it in one day? Because uh, in our team, it's more like at least five days of work to add a new feature. Yeah, yeah, of course, it's up to programmer how much time it's, it, it is required to complete a feature. But even if you are working on, I don't know, the feature, which is like two weeks or two months long, you could still submit like parts of it. And we really encourage to do that, because if you are submitting the small chunks, you will, like, you will not get like a full big merge at the end of the process, right? So it doesn't have to be complete feature, but of course you don't have to do it as well. If you, pref if you prefer to have the local changes or uh, the task stream, because this is like the bigger feature, or maybe this feature will involve more people, then this is like the good scenario for making a task stream and put like, no, no, three programmers there. It's, it's okay, yeah? We don't have to like, we don't have a deadline for, for feature uh, development. There are some features like DirectX 12 implementation that took two and a half months, and it's okay. Yeah, and it, it was being submitted like every week into separate parts of the code, but still it was in the trunk already. So the final integration was very small, small because we like every week do that does the integration, right? So. Okay, and uh, do you remove these parts of code that are yet incomplete? Uh, by using feature flags or something? No, we're just, um, we're just making, we're tr trying to update the code on the trunk as often as possible, right? If there are like new features and they are not completed yet, they are just not being enabled. And yeah, it's up to programmer. You can tag in the comment that it's not like ready yet mm -hmm. uh, or it's just not being submitted, right? It's, it's up to the programmers. We have like from hot fixes, which takes you a minute to to big feature which needs like three months and team of five to really accomplish. So we have like the full spectrum of it. And there are like no rules to do that, yeah? It's, it's up to you how to integrate it into the trunk. But the practice shows that more often you submit your parts of the work, your partial work, the less uh, work you will have at the end when merging everything together. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? No questions. Thank you very much once again.